My name is Brian Musisi. So today we're going to be going through how we can create neural networks in Python. And so the task that we're going to be working with is uh, a digit classification task using what's called the MNIST dataset. And this is a common dataset used in machine learning and uh, uh, with neural networks as well to sort of uh, create a simple image classification task. And image classification is basically looking at an image, and in this case, uh, pixels from an image, and then predicting what sort of, um, <clears throat> uh, not predicting, but more of classifying what is what does the image actually contain. And it's a supervised learning task, meaning that you have uh, pixels, and then you also have uh, what the actual image is. So we are going to use uh, scikit-learn and a number of libraries, which we're going to first import here. And so we are going to load, bring in the MNIST dataset from uh, the Open Data website, which is where uh, this uh, attribute, this function called fetch OpenML, uh, gets it from, and it's going to store it at this uh, at this location in your on your machine. And so what we have as a uh, um, MNIST data is going to be uh, the X, and then MNIST target is the Y, which is the outcome variable. So we're going to be predicting using X and trying to um, learn and uh, predict or classify what the value is in Y. <clears throat> so that may take a few seconds to download. And so if we just look at the shape of the X and Y, so we have 70,000 training examples, um, and uh, there's 784 eight, features and features uh, uh, correspond to different values within the, within the actual image, and each of them has a, a pixel value. And so, and then there's, of course, an equal number of uh, outcomes, which is 70,000. And so if we look at uh, just what the first value in the training data, um, we see the shape is 784, but this is actually a 28 by 28 image. So if we get the square root and just print what that is, we can see it's 28. And this is uh, this basically the square root of this. And so if we reshape this image and then use uh, the image show or IM show um, function from uh, matplotlib, we can then look at this and see that this is actually a five. And uh, you can see here, if we look even within our outcome, it has also been labeled as a five. So this is a five. And when you look at, at this and just look at what the image looks like, it actually looks like a five. We can look at another random example, let's say at 130, and then we can, um, we can see that this, if we reshape this again, and have it be a 28 by 28 image, and look at this, uh, the outcome says it's a three, and we can also see here that this actually looks like a three. So what we're going to do now is actually start to look and train our models. So the first thing we're going to do is, uh, we want to shuffle our data, so we're going to use, uh, uh, the num numpy is a random function to sort of create uh, this this shuffle um, this sh this shuffle attribute that we're going to pass to x and y and bas it's basically just going to help us shuffle these based on their index indices and uh, we're also going to pick 5,000 examples that we shall use for for training and another 5,000 for testing. So what we're going to do is um, after shuffling this is a, this will mean that. Uh, when we select the first 5,000 examples, we're going to be certain that there'll be an, there's an equal chance of finding any of the any of the different digits within the first 5,000 examples and also in the last 5,000 examples. And so, if we run this uh, to create our train and test data, we can see we have 784 features and uh, uh, 5,000 training and test examples. And again, if we look at uh, just look at what uh, the first value has. Uh, these are the 784 different data points, uh, sorry, different uh, features. And so we see that most of them will be zero, and those correspond to the dark parts of what we see here. But then those where there's actually values, and uh, the intensity varies based on, the, based on uh, uh, what the number is in a particular position. So, uh, and this goes from zero all the way to 255. And so if we just look at the shape of the training data and look at uh, a random value from that, we can see that uh, we have uh, 
um, the training data we have values again which we expect to be from 0 to 9 and here for example in the first position we have a 6 and the shape is also a 5000 shape um, uh, 5000 shape uh, 5000 length 1 DRA so uh, we here just want to show you um, a function from scikit-learn called label binarizer and uh, it can help you sort of turn your variables into binary values and we can look at this so what this does is that uh, we have values from 1 up to 6 and so in this case what it's going to do is when you run fit transform it's going to then create uh, sort of uh, arrays um, for each of these different values and what this does is that uh, in the if the value is a 1 uh, so it will have 1 in the first position and then all the other five positions will have zeros and if it's a 4 it will have uh, a 4 in the fourth position and uh, zeros all the, in all the other positions and this sort of um, helps you um, it's, it's an easier way for at times for machine learning algorithms to work with data that's in this case because uh, if you have 1 up to 6 uh, <clears throat> this there's actually no particular ordering here because if, if you're running a classification task this is not the ordering doesn't matter but what you want to know is if is it a one is it a, a three is it a, a five is it a six and this sort of corresponds to one of those uh, values inside here being turned on while the others are off and so how how you'd use this is uh, if you run that and then if we look at um, what the first value here is and uh, the corresponding value so this is the value here is a six and so we can see uh, it's going to be uh, only the the sixth position is going to be turned on so here we see this is zero one two three four five six is turned on so okay so in this case so this won't be important but uh, at times you may need to depending on uh, the algorithm and the library you're using you may need to to do that uh, sort of label binarization and so we're going to move on to classifying using logistic regression so if we run this uh, this is basically your ordinary logistic, logistic regression where the solver using is called lbfgs and uh, it's a it's, it's a multi-class uh, classification problem and we're going to use the OVR multi-class classification so if you look at the at the documentation for uh, in scikit-learn you can sort of see the different options that you have for these variables. So for example, for the solver, um, if we just scroll down, we can see these are different solvers that you have. And then if we look at the multi-class uh, value, these are also the different values that you have that you could use. And so we're going to run this now to fit our, our model. And we can run this too as well. So we're going to be scoring on the train data and then the test data. And so on the train data, we, uh, we, we expect the model to, to generally do well and often better than, and in most cases better than it does on the test data. But uh, at times, if, uh, as you might know already, uh, with the bias variance trade-off, if, if the model is doing very well on the train data, but doing very poor in the test data, that means that you have a case of overfitting. So we often want to see both of these just to sort of compare how well is the model doing and how is it, over, is it overfitting or underfitting. And, um, what some of the things that we may do at uh, sort of the uh, evaluation curves just to understand how, how the model is working at that point. So I won't wait for this to run. Okay, so this has finally finished, and you may be wondering what these errors are about. It's basically saying that the model has not converged uh, within these iterations, but it should still be able to give us uh, uh, answers. And so we can see here the score is uh, on the train data is basically 100%, while the score on the test data is 82%. 82%. And so this could signify that uh, the model was overfitting on this data. And um, because here it has got a perfect score, while here this score is just uh, basically 82, 83 percent. 
So we're going to now, so this is sort of our baseline and that we need to beat with our neural network. So we're going to now try with uh, a neural network and uh, in scikit-learn, uh, this neural network is provided uh, under a function called MLP classifier. And what this takes is an, uh, are the hidden layer sizes. And so the hidden layer sizes we're going to give it is 100, which means that we're giving it one hidden layer and uh, which is going to have a size of, a, of 100 which means 100 neurons within the hidden layer. And if we want to give it even more hidden layers, we could do something like this, 200 or 100. And this will be a, a neural network with three hidden layers, with, each la with the first layer having uh, 100 neurons, the second having 200, and the last having 100 neurons. So I'm going to take it back to how it was and then run this. <clears throat> and we have Verbos is equal to true here, which you can turn on or off. But Verbos is equal to true allows you to have for it to show you in, in every iteration what the loss is and expect this loss to keep decreasing with every iteration. And the iteration is basically each going through the, the different samples and giving you results. So here is uh, uh, the model has finished training so now we can score it on the train data and the test data. So we can see that uh, the train score is just a little less um, but the test score has improved from, um, this was 83% to about basically 90%. And uh, this is an improvement, so and it's sort of what we're expecting to get from neural networks, <coughs> that sort of improvement because they provide, they are able to understand more complex functions. And so we're now going to try with, uh, by increasing the size of the hidden layer. And so before we had 100 neurons in the hidden layer, but now we're going to work with 300 and we could just run this again. So here is uh, uh, the model has finished training, so now we can score it on the train data and the test data. So we can see that uh, the train score is just a little less, um, but the test score has improved from, um, this was 83% to about basically 90%. And uh, this is an improvement, so and it's sort of what we're expecting to get from neural networks. <clears throat> that sort of improvement because they provide, they are able to understand more complex functions. And so we're now going to try with, uh, by increasing the size of the hidden layer. And so before we had 100 neurons in the hidden layer, but now we're going to work with 300. And we could just run this again. And wait for it to, co to fit and converge. <clears throat> and so this is now, this is now basically uh, almost 100%, so it's 99.6% on the test data, but uh, we see on the, sorry, on the train data, but on the test data we see it has now even improved and gone beyond the 89%, and now it's uh, about 91, 92%. And so we could try this again and even use even more hidden layers and, uh, and uh, increase the size of hidden layers as well. So if we run this, just see what it gives us. <coughs> so this is finished, and uh, we can see there's not much improvement in this case, but uh, we can see it's, it's the, the, the model still does better than we had in the first case with the logistic regression. And uh, so basically, uh, the size of the hidden layers and the number of hidden layers are hyperparameters that you'll have to tune, uh, ideally using a validation data set and then uh, try to get the right number of hidden layers and uh, the hidden layer size. So we're now going to use what's probably the most common neural network library. It's called TensorFlow provided by, by Google. So if you don't have this already, you can run this to install TensorFlow. So I already have this installed, so um, I won't run that. So we're going to import uh, TensorFlow here and uh, TensorFlow in uh, the more recent versions, particularly version 2.0, uh, added an API called Keras. Keras allows it to uh, make, to make uh, the creation of these neural network models easier. So earlier on in version, and the earlier versions of TensorFlow, and uh, for example in version 1.0, um, you had to sort of set up these net networks with a very low layer uh, API, which made it very difficult, but now we can sort of just uh, combine different layers of, of uh, the neural network and create uh, a model that we can use. <coughs> so, 
for example, in this case here, we're going to use the sequential API, and what this does is you just give it different layers. For example, this is a, a dense hidden layer, and dense means that it's a fully connected layer, which has 128 neurons, and uh, we, we're going to add dropout, a dropout layer. So dropout means that uh, uh, what this does is that it randomly chooses uh, hidden layers, so neurons to, to drop and not use uh, within the model. And so by giving it a value of 0 0.2, that means that 20% of the neurons are going to be randomly dropped. And this is sort of like a regularization, similar to what, we, what you see in a logistic and linear regression, and it helps with reducing overfitting. And so in the end, we're going to have a dense layer of size 10, which corresponds to the 0 to 9, uh, 10, the 10 digits that we have. So we're going to run this. Uh, we're going to create a loss function for it. And uh, this is a cross entropy loss function. Cross entropy is a, uh, it's a concept that comes from information theory. And it's, it's basically about uh, finding uh, uh, the difference between two, uh, <coughs> two sort of signals in information theory. But in this case, it's going to be two arrays. And uh, what, what you want to, to, to have is that uh, the difference between them should be as small as possible, and that's what the loss is. And so the larger the difference between them, the larger the loss is going to be. And this is a, a perfect loss function for us to use in this case. So we can compile this, and uh, the optimizer is going to be Adam. And Adam is basically an optimizer just like uh, you've seen with uh, gradient descent. And so we can run this to fit, and uh, it's going to run through different epochs. And uh, here we see the loss. Uh, the loss should be decreasing with every epoch, while the accuracy should be increasing, like we see here. And so when we run this, um, we can see on the train data, we have a score of 94%, while on the test data, our accuracy is about uh, 87%. So we're going to now increase the number of hidden layers and their sizes as well. So here we have we're adding an extra hidden layer and maybe wondering what the activation function here is, but this is something that we looked at before. This is a railway activation function that uh, pro helps provide a non-linearity <coughs> in neural networks, and there's a number of other activation functions that, like we looked at before. And so the rest of the model is going to be the same, and so we can just run this and just see what this looks like. <coughs> so yeah, so we asked it to run through, uh, 10 epochs for us, so it has run those. And here we see the score is 97% on the train data, but uh, while uh, on the test data, it's uh, 91 and 2%. And so we are now going to be even more ambitious and add another hidden layer and see what this gives us. And we're going to train with 20 epochs this time. And hopefully giving you 20 more epochs um, won't overfit, but will get us closer to what we want. And if we evaluate this time, we see that the, the score on the train data is 99%, while the score on the test data is, as, is the highest that we've seen up to now, and it's 93%. So in this case, we've seen the new, using neural network has gotten us all the way from around um, 82, 83%, and we've gotten all the way to 93%, uh, which is a 10% jump in accuracy. And so this is what we're basically expecting from when using neural networks, and, when, and next we're going to look at how we can use this with convolutional neural networks, which are even more tailored towards image classification tasks like this one, and should give us an even bigger increase in uh, uh, accuracy. So yeah, we shall continue from there. Thank you.